Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. Remlois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program. My humble experience in experimental encounters with modern physics, namely the search for fundamental building blocks of nature. For the last 400 years, we have built many accelerators. The first one is 1612, and extremely low energy, where Galileo did his gravity experiment. This accelerator still exists today, costs not much, but perhaps had the most profound influence you or not. This is the latest accelerator, has a circumference of 16 miles, extremely high energy, and the purpose to study the fundamental building blocks of nature. From this study, we now know in an atom outside is electron. Inside the atom is the nucleus. Inside the nucleus are particles. When you break the particles apart, are quarks. That's what we know now. So I will share with you five short stories. The first story is measuring the size of the electron. The modern electromagnetic theory by Feynman, Schwinger, and Tomonaga in 1948 requires that the electron has no radius, namely, has no size. The theory agreed well with all experiments until a large electron accelerator built by Harvard and MIT in 1960s provided the most sensitive measurement of the size of the electron. This experiment was done by world's leading experts in the field who has spent many years to develop the technology for this experiment. How do you measure the size of the electron? Just like you measure anything else, you need a light. So to measure, very, to measure the electron, you need a very high energy light. And the light was built based on a, a thousand feet circumference the electron accelerator and generate six billion electron volt light and to probe whether you see the size of the electron. And this was done by Harvard MIT team. That experiment, published in 64, shows the measurement compared with the theory. Theory is the theory of Feynman, Schwinger, Tomonaga, based on electron has zero size. And clearly, you see a deviation. This deviation shows electron then have a, because the deviation occurring here, 10 to the minus 13 to 10 to the minus 14 centimeter. Most importantly, this experiment was independently confirmed by a respected group at Cornell. Those were done by three of the world's leading ex experimentalists. Since those results touch upon the foundations of modern physics, I decided to repeat the experiment with the independent method. At that time, I just left Michigan. I've never done experiment by myself. I knew nothing about electron physics. So I received no support whatsoever. <laughs> so in 65, I decided to leave Columbia University and move to the newly built six billion electron volt electron accelerator called DAISY in Hamburg, Germany, to redo this experiment. So this was the detector I set it up, and this gentleman was a student at that time, Stuart Smith, and now for, year, for many years, the head of the physics department at Princeton, now I think it's the dean of research. So 10 months later, in 66, I repeated the experiment with a different method and discovered that 
all measurement compared with the theory, theory is based on electron zero side, are totally in agreement. And electron has no measurable, measurable size. Its radius is less than 10 to the minus 14 centimeter. So my first lesson, <laughs> do not always follow the op opinion of experts. My second story is the discovery of new family of quarks. By 1970, all the known elementary particles can be traced to three types of quarks. A pi ion is a U and a D quark. A proton could be U, two U's and D. Then I asked the question, why only three types of quarks? To look for new quark, I decided to set up a very sensitive detector with a sensitivity such that the new quark over old quark, namely signal, signal to background, is one part in 10 billion. What does one part in 10 billion mean? During the rainy season over Detroit, there are about 10 billion raindrops per second. If one of them is slightly different color, you want to find that one. <laughs> and so this experiment was not popular with the physics community <laughs> because uh, all the theoretical physicists <clears throat> believe there are only three types of quarks because you can explain all the phenomena at that time. And no, for the experimentalists, no one believes such a difficult experiment can be carried out. So the experiment was rejected by nearly every accelerator laboratory in the world. Finally, Brookhaven National Laboratory approved the experiment in 1972. And this is uh, the experimental layout. And because the intensity is a trillion particle per second, and so you have, a, you have to set up a very, very sensitive detector, and we have to develop many new instruments. And this is a proportional wire chamber developed by Ulrich Becker at MIT, which has a precision of 100 micron and radiation resistant with a 200 megahertz. And this has been exhibited as a Smithsonian, and perhaps it's still there. So when we finally carry out this experiment at Brookhaven National Laboratory, we did discover a new particle with unexpected long lifetime, namely 10,000 times longer than all the known particles. Shortly after, an uh, entire family of particles with similar long lifetime was discovered at SLAC and in Germany. The significance of this discovery is similar to discovery in a remote region of the Earth a village where people live, instead of 100 years old, lives close to a million years old, then you will think these people are a bit strange. And this implies the existence of a new form of matter made of new kind of quarks. So the concept of three kind of quarks were wrong, and we now know there are at least six types of quarks, and you call them U, D, S, C, B, and T, but you can call them whatever you want. <laughs> and so this was uh, in the New York Times, November 1774, new and uh, surprising type of atomic particle found. This is what Professor Jones said. In the expected spectra, of the electron positron pair, you suddenly see a peak. And the width of this peak indicates it's an extremely long lifetime. So my lesson two for experimental physicists, it's extremely important to keep faith in yourself. Do what you think is right. I remember at that time, when I started the experiment, <clears throat> everybody was objecting. My third story is the discovery of gluons. 
photon or light ray is the carrier of force in the atom is bound between an electron and nucleus. Gluon, at least theoretically, was the carrier of force between quarks, bound the quarks together. In the late 70s and early 80s, the world's first large electron positron collider was in Hamburg, and uh, where electron go in one direction, positron go in another direction. So I set up a detector there, which is called Mark J. The original purpose of the experiment was to continue to measure the size of the electron. And so this is uh, the detector. After the experiment set up, then we begin to realize if when you have a positron electron collision, you produce a pair of quarks. And indeed, if they are gluons, and with the increase of energy of the gluon, instead of uh, you have two jets, you have uh, three jets. And the length of the, uh, the size of the jet is dependent on the energy of the gluon. And sure enough, we see this. And this was uh, in the physics today of February 1980, shows our work when, when gluon has low energy, you have only quark and anti-quark. With increasing energy, you have quark, anti-quark, and gluon. And uh, when the energy is higher, you see very clear three jets. And that was a, there was a long article in September 2nd, 1979, detecting of elusive gluon exciting scientists. This turned out to be somewhat of an important discovery. And that is because in nature, there are three type of forces. Gravitation, even though it was discovered in, 19, in 16, 10 or so, what carries gravitation? The carrier of gravitation force has never been found. <clears throat> At University of Michigan, Professor Keith Ryers is involved in a very important experiment trying to find the carrier force for, for gravitation. The electroweak force has been discovered with gamma ray, Z0, and Ws. Nuclear force is carried out by gluons. And so this discovery has some meaning. And to my knowledge, this is the first time in New York Times they have nearly an entire page to describe this. And uh, I was quite impressed, impressed because uh, after I talked with them for a day, I, they actually got it right. <laughs> <laughs> so my third lesson is be prepared for surprises. Because when we start the experiment, to look for gluon was not in our mind at all. I only have five stories, so this talk will be very short. <laughs> the fourth story is I would like to make some remarks on large international scientific collaboration. I was involved for many years in the Air 3 experiment which is located in the 16 mile large electron positron accelerator. This experiment involved in 20 years, 600 physicists from 20 countries. The detector is very large. It's, uh, the weight of the magnet is about 10,000 tons. It's six story high. And for reference, this is Switzerland, this is France, this is the Geneva airport, and I live around here. It's a very large international collaboration involving about 60 institutes. What is the physics? When you have a 100 billion electron volt electron, 100 billion electron volt positron collide, during the collision, you produce high temperature. The temperature is about 400 billion times the surface of the sun. And if you believe the universe comes from a big bang, what you're doing is in the laboratory, using this accelerator to create the first, fir uh, very, very beginning of the universe, to see at the beginning what is going on. I have mentioned to you the world is made out of point-like particles. We have found six quarks, 
and three type of uh, electron, electron, mu and tau, and its neutral charge uh, and its neutral massless partner called neutrinos. But then you can ask the following question. How many types of electrons are there? How large are the electrons? Can electrons be divided into smaller particles? Of course, if you talk to theoretical friends, friends and these are not their interesting question because they, most of them will think they know the answer already. <laughs> but in physics, unless you measure, you do not know. The second question is, how many quarks are there? Why are there only six? How large are the quarks? Can quarks be divided into smaller particles? So those are the very simple questions. So this is a de detector. When the electron passes on colliding here, surround the detector is a vertex detector. And then outside are BGO crystals. And these are crystals, has a density of stainless steel, but it's totally transparent. When we start the experiment, the world's production was four kilo per year. And we need 12 tons. So it was a somewhat of a difficult problem to solve. And then this is the magnet. One of the coils is about four stories high. All these things look very complicated. But in experimental physics, the fundamental idea is always very simple. So you have a vertex detector, you have the crystal, and you have something called colorimeter, you have a muon detector. So an electron will leave this type of trace, muon will leave this type of trace, Light rays leave this type of trace. Ordinary nuclear particles leave this type of trace. And this is how you distinguish them. And one of the major things is the hadron colorimeter, made out of 300 tons of uranium. And University of Michigan, Professor Rowe, who is here today, and Professor Jones. And together, this is Professor Jones here with people from Switzerland, from Russia, and from China build this detector. There are many precision instrumentations. Around this detector, are this mu uh, around this experiment are the muon detector. And this is one of the 16 octants. And this muon detector has an area of 900 square meters, but the precision is 30 microns. It is controlled by a light emission dial, a lens, and a photodial. You monitor the stability in 17 microns. This experiment started during the Cold War period. It was really the first large-scale collaboration between Europe, USA, the Soviet Union, and China. In fact, it was the first collaboration between these two less than friendly countries. And uh, it was not a cheap experiment, but most important is enormous amount of physicists spent many years to work on this. This is the front page of Scientific American depict a computer reconstruction of electron passes on collision. Analyze this event, we have published 300 physics letters. So 300, about 300 PhD degrees was awarded. But this result can be summarized in a few sentences. The first, within the available energy region, there are, o there are only three types of electrons. Namely, the electron we are familiar with, electron from space, and the electron in the nucleus. And there are only six types of quarks. But most important, at least to me, is electrons and quarks has no size. The radii is less than 10 to the minus 17 centimeter. The 300 paper, the results are in excellent agreement 
with the model of glacial Wamber and Salam. This, of course, is most unfortunate because when your results agree with the theory, you have learned nothing. When the results destroy a theory, you learn something new. So as you can see, I've spent close to 40 years to measure the size of the electron. When I first started, I showed the electron size is less than 10 to the minus 14 centimeter. It took nearly 40 years to reduce the <laughs> upper limit by three order of magnitude. So it's a difficult thing. And uh, perhaps I have the wrong approach. And recently, somebody has told me, you got it all wrong. There's a better way to do it. And that is shown in this slide. That the quarks, neutrinos, mesons, or <laughs> those damn particles you can see. And that's what drove me to drink. Now I can see them. <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, this uh, doesn't work for me because I'm somewhat allergic to alcohol. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, maybe this indeed is a good approach. So I would like to make a comment on a very important subject, namely how you organize a large international collaboration. When I first started, the group has about 10 physicists. Gradually, this is a group in Brookhaven, a group in Hamburg, and a group in Switzerland, and recently I've been doing experiments in space. So the group has gone from 100 physicists to close to 1,000 physicists. When you have a publication with 1,000 names, <laughs> you ask, what does it mean? And this is uh, shown in here. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <clears throat> uh, so a publication, your name on the paper, doesn't mean everything. And to have a large group together, most of the people who collaborate with me normally have collaborated with me for 30 years, 40 years. One of the very important things is always promote and support young physicists. I view that as one of my most important jobs. In early days in, in Germany, I have a small group, and most of them now become professors at MIT, and Robert Marshall is a professor in, in Oxford. And at Brookhaven, most of the people are professors, including Monsieur Jean-Jacques Orbet, who for many years was in charge of the National Science Foundation in France. And in, in Germany, there's Harvey Newman, a professor at Caltech, Francois Venucci, professor in Paris, <coughs> Maduda, professor in KEK, and then in Hamburg, and then Masaki Fukushima in Tokyo, namely the hundreds and hundreds of professors. Because I take it as one of my most important thing is to support young physicists. And at uh, this great university, there's Professor Binzo, Professor Chen, Keith Swires. They are professors here. It's a privilege for me to work with them. And then there's a Susan Cooper, Professor in Oxford. All of this and many more become leaders in their field. So my Fourth lesson is a large international collaboration <coughs> has become a trend in some area of fundamental research. 
They involve many countries of diversified social economic origins and often last for decades and cost between 100 million to a billion. To lead a successful international collaboration, it is important to first choose an important topic. It's only through choosing an important topic people will work with you. And remember, in science, the fundamental ideas are simple. And second important thing, at least for me, is to always make a maximum effort to promote the young physicists. And third is respect the diversity of your collaborators. And often we'll have Indians, Pakistanis, Taiwanese, Chinese, and uh, many, many very diversified groups. So it is very important when you run a large group, only deal with physics and nothing else. <laughs> and the most important thing, when you have for 20 countries work with you, different people have different ideas, and the thing that you must never compromise is the instrumentation. Because if you compromise on instrumentation, because of political consideration or financial considerations, you will always regret it. This is my last story. And that is uh, the alpha magnetic spectrometer experiment, which we are trying to do on the International Space Station. You can understand the importance of doing fundamental science on the International Space Station by remember in space, there are two types of cosmic rays. One is light ray. The light ray has been measured by Hubble telescope and by other for 50 years. Nearly all the fundamental discoveries in space has done by measuring light rays in space and underground. 10 person has received Nobel Prizes. But in space, beside light rays, there are charged particles. Because it has a charge, it carries a mass. And because it carries a mass, it's absorbed in Earth's atmosphere. And therefore, this has never been measured precisely. And so this is an unexplored region in science. When you study cosmic rays, charged cosmic rays, the first thing you need to realize, the highest energy particles are produced in cosmos. No matter how large accelerator you, you build, you cannot compete with cosmic, high energy cosmic rays. A magnetic spectrometer on the space station is the only way to measure high energy charged cosmic rays. And so this is the Hubble telescope. This is the completed AMS detector. So this experiment has took us 13 years, 16 countries, from 60 institutes involving 500 physicists. From the United States, Mexico, Finland, Denmark, Holland, France, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Switzerland, Romania, Germany, Russia, Korea, Taiwan, and China. Rely on NASA's promise to deploy us on the space station, nearly all the cost to build this detector has come from outside the United States. And it has a widespread support from Europe and Asia. Nearly all the major university institutions in Europe are involved in this experiment. The idea is a very simple one. If you believe the universe comes from a big bang, you build accelerators to get to the beginning of the big bang. But if it, before the big bang, 
it is vacuum. Right at the beginning, if you have the electron, you must have a positron. If you have a quark, you must have an anti-quark. And that is because before the Big Bang, there's nothing. And so now the universe is 15 billion years old. Okay, we have all of us. And the question is, where is the universe made out of antimatter? A very simple question. The existence of antimatter was proposed in 1928 by the great British physicist Paul Dirac. And he received the Nobel Prize in 1933 after positron was discovered. In his Nobel lecture, he said, in the equation of motion of relativity and the equation of motion of quantum theory, mass appear as square. Square means can be m times m, can be minus m times minus m. So Dirac asked, what is minus m? And therefore leading to the theory of antimatter. And so for some truly outstanding physicists to get a Nobel Prize is quite simple. <laughs> so one of my earliest work was the discovery of anti antinuclear matter showing here in June 1465 in the New York Times, physicists produce antimatter particle in a complex form. You all know a deuteron is a combination of proton and neutron. So the question is, does an antimatter nuclear exist? Namely, anti-deuteron made of anti-proton plus anti-neutron. And this was one of my earliest experiments. This means we know on Earth every particle has its antiparticle. So the existence of antiparticle is not a question. The question is, is there a universe made out of antimatter? In the universe, in cosmic rays, we have uh, different nuclei. The question is, is there an antimatter universe produce anti-helium and anti-carbon? Cosmic antimatter cannot be detected on Earth because matter and antimatter annihilate each other in the atmosphere. We live under 100 kilometers of the atmosphere. Since matter and antimatter has opposite electric charge, to distinguish matter from antimatter, you need a magnetic detector to measure the charge of a nuclei and by detecting the trace of charge in magnetic field. So positive particle, matter go one way, a negative antimatter go the opposite way. As you know, I've been doing, <laughs> I've been doing accelerator physics on the ground for many years. Okay. So I, when I first went to NASA, and uh, people said, you don't know what you're doing. And uh, one of the difficulty for putting a magnet in space. If you, if you hang a magnetic needle with a wire, it will always point to the north. One end to north, another end to the south. Imagine you put a large magnet on a space shuttle, and the space shuttle will always rota rotate, and so you lose control. <laughs> and that is one of the reasons for years nobody solved this problem. And so finally NASA, agreed with us to do this experiment, um, but uh, then they were suspicious of us and said, well, look, you first build a magnetic spectrometer, fly on the space shuttle, and say wh what you get. And so we, this experiment was approved in 95. We managed to assemble everything rather quickly by making all the detectors in Europe, and the magnet we used for first flight, we use a permanent magnet. As you all know, the world's best permanent magnet material come from Inner Mongolia, which is part of China. So the magnet was made in China. The electronics was made at uh, MIT 
manufacturer in Taiwan. And so in two years, we have assembled everything. And these are the six astronauts. And this is uh, the detector and went to the space shuttle. And uh, since this is the first time we're entering into a new window, we did see unexpected things. Let me share three examples with you. The first is the existence of two spectra in the proton flux. So the space shuttle fly in low Earth orbit. When it's near the equator, the charged particle go in perpendicular to the magnetic field. So the flux increases with decreased energy. Because it's perpendicular to the magnetic field, it bends away. When you gradually go north, the particle is more parallel to the magnetic field, so the cutoff becomes less and less. So this phenomenon was long predicted, first published in 1956 by the late Sam Truman of Princeton University. Nobody thought this flux doesn't go down, and there actually a second flux. Second unexpected result is a function of geomagnetic latitude near the equator for very high energy. There seems to be more, four times more positrons than electron. The Earth is five billion years old. You will imagine the number positive and negative must be the same. No, that is not true. The third unexpected result is in space, we have helium. Helium has two isotopes. Helium-4, the normal helium, two protons, two neutrons. So the mass is 3.65 billion electron volt. Helium-3 is two protons, one neutron. The mass is 2.86. But if you look at the energy distribution as a function of geomagnetic latitude, most of the region is helium-4. But near the equator, a low energy is helium-3. So for totally unknown reason, even after five billion years, helium-4 and helium-3 are totally separated in space. But the most important thing is the last sentence. None of these results were predicted by a cosmic ray model. So after we have done that, we have a very large international collaboration, try to build an experiment for the space station. <clears throat> so this is the detector. In the top is called transition radiation detector, identify electrons. These two layers is the time of flight detector, identify nuclear charge and energy, a superconducting magnet with a silicon tracker, identify nuclear charge and energy, a ring image thermal counter, identify nuclear charge and energy, and a calorimeter measure electrons and light rays. You require a quarter of a shuttle to the space station. You will notice there are threefold redundancy to measure nuclear charge and energy. The superconducting magnet provides a field of 10,000 Gauss. There are 300,000 channels of electronics with 650 microprocessors, provide the accuracy of time measurement of 100 picosecond, space measurement of 10 micron, and velocity measurement to an accuracy of one part in a thousand. So what we try to do is to push to the technical limit. And so an electron, when you go through this detector, we leave this type of trace, proton leave this type of trace, I don't leave this type of trace. It's just like when you go to a hospital, you do a CAT scan, you quickly know what's going on. Except this, you have to do it quickly. This, the detector's finished, so we test them in accelerators. And this shows at the 200 billion electron volt, we can simultaneously measure all the nuclei. This is a test result. The coordinate resolution is 10 micron. Velocity resolution is one part in a thousand. Time resolution is one tenth of a nanosecond. 
The superconducting magnet in space is a difficult thing. It is cooled by 2,500 liters of superfluid helium, and so it lasts for three to four years. Three to five years. Have two large dipoles and two sets of six raised by coils so that it doesn't rotate in space. Superconduction was discovered in 1908. Superconducting occur at a very low temperature, 452 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. At this low temperature, atoms are at rest. Pairs of electrons move without friction and allow a large amount of current to go through. It took close to 70 years to use it. One of the problem is called quench. Quench is the loss of superconductivity due to local microheating. Namely, in a magnet, you have thousands, millions of wires. If one of them touches another, and you generate a small amount of heat. Once you have a small amount of heat, atom tends to move, and then you quickly lose superconductivity. In space, this will be rather unfortunate. Now, there has never been a superconducting magnet in space due to the extremely difficult technical challenges. A magnet on ground, like the Atlas, which is University of Michigan, is very much involved. It weighs 10,000 tons. In space, you weigh two tons. The volume can be as large as a six-story building. In space, it must fit to the space shuttle. The power on the ground is 10 megawatt. In space, there's no power. So once the magnet is charged, you must design a way that is circulating and do not require additional power. And there are 50 years of experience, there's no experience to build that. So the Swiss government has spent enormous amount of effort for many technical development to build this magnet. Most of the technical development were done in Switzerland, Germany, Spain, and Italy. The first thing we have to do is to develop a new cable. And this is a normal superconductive cable, and outside when encased with a high purity aluminum of 20 parts per million. High purity aluminum at low temperature is a very good heat conductor. So in case there's a micro amount of heat, it's taken away by the aluminum. But once you want to do that, between the aluminum and the cable better be uniform, so there's no friction. And so for a cable of 105 kilometer, the uniformity is four microns. Only the Swiss know how to do that. <laughs> and there are other new technology we have to develop. The first is a thermal mechanical pump to transfer superfluid helium at zero gravity in a small, in a strong magnetic field. How do you transfer the helium? You cannot use a pump. Pump has moving parts. Anything has a moving part has a chance to cause trouble. And so this um, thermal mechanical pump is basically a heater that this side warmer than this side by 100 of a degree. No more fluid. Always go from warm to cold. Super fluid helium is a Bose-Einstein gas. Go from cold to warm. And this is how you transfer super fluid helium. And then we developed a passive phase separator to remove helium vapor. So this is a coil. The heat of the coil is taken away by cold heat exchanger. So in the helium tank, the superfluid helium absorb the heat, become vapor. The volume of the vapor is 2,500 times larger than the liquid. So you have to remove it quickly. To remove this, we develop a device that this side is warmer than this side by 1,000 of a degree. Liquid helium is both Einstein gas. Go from cold to warm, and there, therefore it stays. Vapor go from warm to cold, therefore it moves. A very simple device, but to keep it to 1,000 of a degree is not an easy thing. And we need two. We made six, 
And these are not cheap devices. I think uh, they cost nearly $1.5 million each. And then these are the transition radiation detector and use the fact when you have a particle with very low mass goes through the radiator, it emits a gamma ray. If you have a tube with a wire center, and then you can pick up this gamma ray, you know an electron has gone through. A proton, because of the heavy mass goes slower, it doesn't emit gamma ray. But the first thing you have to do, you must make sure this tube doesn't leak, because in space there's no way to fill the gas. And then you must make sure the wire must be centered. So with 5,000 tubes, we actually build 10,000, and we let them, the, the tubes are about 10 feet long, and we let them go through a CAT scan machine in a German hospital and make sure they're all centered. And it is from this we realize how expensive hospitals are. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have this uh, six square meters of high precision silicon with 200,000 channel and a line to three microns. These are mostly made in Switzerland and Italy, one by one under microscope. So this is a, a finished detector. And we actually now have cosmic, cosmic ray go through it. So let me tell you what we can learn. So let me share with you some early history of uh, fundamental discoveries of charged cosmic ray in the atmosphere. Cosmic ray was discovered in 19, 1912 by Victor Hess. Positron was discovered by Carl Anderson in 1932. Pi meson, the transmission of nuclear force, was discovered in 1947. All three were awarded Nobel Prizes. Many, many, many particles were discovered in the 50s, lay the foundation of modern physics. After 53, accelerator appeared, so people gradually moved to accelerators. But as accelerators become exceedingly costly, the space station is a valuable alternative to study fundamental physics. I already mentioned if the universe comes from a big bang, there should be somewhere an uh, antimatter universe. The detector is designed on the space station for three years, you'll collect two billion nuclei. If after two billion nuclei, you still do not see a heavy antinuclear, that means you have reached the age of observable universe and there's no antimatter. And this is why you need to build such a large detector with such sensitivity. You want to do something, important. Second is the search for the origin of dark matter. 20% of the matter in the universe is not observable. It's called dark matter. The present state of knowledge suggests a new particle is responsible for dark matter. Since highest energy particles are produced in cosmos, AMS will explore dark matter in region not covered by accelerators such as Large Hadron Collider. If dark matter exists, then the positron to electron ratio, instead of flat, you will have an enhancement. Of course, Professor Gordy King, who one is one of the originators and of supersymmetry idea, has for years provided guiding spirit for all the world ex experimentalists to look for dark matter. It's really my great honor to know him and really learn a lot from him. So because when go to very high energy, you look for positron as uh, anti-proton to proton ratio, if there's no more spectrum, and this will be when you have a dark matter with energy close to one TV outside the reach of the next linear uh, large hadron collider. So the detector was built with multiple redundancies. <laughs> and we have built the detector 
emphasis on precision, reliability, and safety, and we have not made a single compromise on instrumentation. As a consequence, it is not the cheapest thing in the world. The question is, what you really can discover? So let me share with you what you're really going to discover. In the 60s, after I started work for Professor Jones and Pearl, <laughs> the world's highest energy accelerator is the Brookhaven AGS. At that time, the experts' opinion, the most important thing why this accelerator should be built is to study pi and nuclear interaction. What was discovered with precision instrumentation is two kinds of neutrino, time reversal, non-symmetry, new form of matter, namely the J particle. Fermi National Laboratory in the 70s was to study neutrino physics. What was discovered was the fifth and sixth quark. Slack originally was to study property of quantum electricity. What was discovered was partons, fourth quark, and third lepton. The large electron positron collider built in Hamburg was to look for the sixth quark. What was discovered was gluons. Hubble telescope. The original purpose for galactic survey among its discoveries is the flat coverage of the universe and the existence of dark energy. So you look for a new instrument. When you want a pure instrument, you have world's leading expert say you can do this when you discover something, and that's this normally have nothing to do with the original purpose. And the reason, of course, is very simple. Experts opinion is based on existing knowledge. Discovery is adding to the existing knowledge. So I've wasted all of you nearly an hour time to say how important AMS is in, uh, Yes, on the station, can look for dark matter, antimatter. If we ever get this to the station, what do we discover perhaps have nothing to do with that, what I've just said? <laughs> so most importantly for a physicist is to be curious, enjoy what you're doing, and try to work hard to achieve your goal. Thank you. My question is, if you, uh, if you get AMS on orbit, will it provide real-time information, or do you have to wait to bring it home? No, real-time information. I wonder, how do, you, like, how do you detect the particles, like cosmic rays? I mean, to, to detect the particles, you need you some kind of... Trace. You You measure its charge, you measure its mass, you measure its energy. So, I mean, what kind of interactions do you use? I mean, in order to detect it, there should be some kind of reactions or something. No, you, you, as I just mentioned, when a particle goes through a detector, it lo always loss energy. And from the amount of, the, the loss of energy is depend on the charge. Okay. And from this, you basically detect this. And you measure its velocity. From this, you determine its mass. I was just wondering about the radius of the electron, um, which you haven't found yet. Is that, do you think it's because it's just too small to have one, or do you think a radius is something that spherical things have and it maybe isn't spherical? And did you see there was a picture on the internet of an electron, it seemed to be, but it was an animation which I couldn't understand what it was showing last week. Uh, I did not watch the internet, so I cannot answer the last <laughs> Uh, most of the, uh, from the theory of uh, Schwinger, Feynman, Tomonaga in 1948, okay, in order to renormalize the mass and charge, the electron must have zero radius. But if you don't measure it, you never know. So I have no way to answer this except measuring. 
There's an alternative way, but it doesn't work for me. <laughs> if you don't measure, you will never know. Could the, uh, the experiment on the space shuttle tell us anything about dark energy? I mean, yeah, dark energy? Yes. Uh, you could, by measure very low energy gamma rays. But uh, uh, we, that is not the main purpose. We, I don't think uh, we can compete with JDAM and the specially designed. These byproducts are never as good as you specially designed. That's why I did not talk about this. I'm a little bit confused about uh, the experiment where you had the electron and anti-electron collisions, and that's where the gluon was discovered. Um, I would have thought that you would have been looking for particles that were components of the items you were colliding. Instead, it seems that you're generating the gluons from the energy released from the electron-anti-electron collision. When the electron and the positron collide, most of the people say the energy will form matter and antimatter, namely quark and antiquark. Quark and antiquark on the way out become particles. It's a process called fragmentation. But if you have a gluon, when the energy is high enough, the gluon can sort of break free like a quark on the way out and become another bunch of particles. And then you have three jets. The existence of the three jets you can the shape, the rate, can be calculated by the theory called QCD. And the result agrees exactly with QCD and shows indeed as glue. How do you isolate a particle to collide with another particle? Uh, very important question. Depends on the resolution. Depends on how, how. This is why the resolution is uh, 10 micron. So, so the next particle is, if it's 10 microns away, uh, you can distinguish it. This is also a reason why in accelerator, the detector has to be very big because there are enormous amount of particles. In space, the amount of particles is much less. What was the mistake that uh, the Cornell physicist and other physicists um, made to measure a non-zero radius for the electron, which you apparently didn't make? <laughs> I do not know. It's impolite to criticize other people. I think. <laughs> you, you, don't, you, you don't want me to do that. Uh, there's a lady. Yeah, go ahead. I think the front page of the New York Times once had the discovery of a magnetic monopole on the front page or something. Uh, can you detect those? Yes, we can detect that. And it's obvious because we measure the charge, we measure the, we measure the magnetic tra uh, measure the track, and so the signature is very unique. Um, the, the graviton, if it exists, has never been detected. How would you design an experiment to detect the graviton? Uh, I don't know. Professor Keith Ryers, is he here? Is he, uh, I know there's a Lego experiment and also the experiment in in Pisa, Italy, to, no, to de detect graviton. Why, what is so difficult? Because your detection is using the electromagnetic device. Gravitational force is many, many, many order of magnitude less. And so you have enormous amount of disturbance. That is the fundamental difficulty. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program.